Okay, and then I'm going to spotlight. Ryan, I lost you somewhere in there. Ah, oh, there you are, okay. Okay, so uh, Crozier, tell us what is going on with regard to energy with a particular focus on uh, noting our focus is heavily solar here. You bet, uh, thank you all for having me, happy to be here. Um, my name is Crozer Connor. I've worked for Congressman Thompson for about five and a half years now. Uh, I work for him in Washington, D.C. I handle all of his economic and healthcare and housing policy, uh, which has made for a, a, a busy 18 months. Um, and I, uh, I'm originally from upstate New York, which is about the climatic opposite of Northern California, but uh, I have been with Mike for a while now and uh, certainly familiar with, uh, with your group. I thought what I would do is uh, briefly outline what Congressman Thompson is doing in the, in the clean energy solar space, uh, and then transition to sort of a general overview of the landscape for solar uh, legislation over the next, uh, next year and a half. Um, I think a lot of you know, probably from, <laughs> probably from Mike himself, uh, Mike is pretty much front and center in the clean energy tax space. Um, he's on the Ways and Means Committee, which has the has jurisdiction over the tax code. And Mike is the chairman of the tax subcommittee, which uh, e even more specifically has jurisdiction over the tax code. And so uh, in thinking about how Mike could be a leader in our collective fight against climate change, uh, we started asking the question several years ago, you know, what, what tools are at our disposal in the tax code uh, that can incentivize or disincentivize behaviors that are, are helpful or harmful uh, to the, the overall climate fight? Um, and to that end, we, we have now twice introduced legislation that we've called the Green Act, uh, which is a pretty sweeping uh, package of clean energy tax policies. Um, this includes everything from uh, tax credits for solar uh, investment, the, the, the solar ITC, uh, investment tax credits for geothermal projects, for offshore wind projects, fuel cells, micro turbines, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, it extends credits for carbon sequestration, uh, direct air capture, uh, biodiesel and re renewable fuel production, um, energy efficient properties for res in residential neighborhoods. Uh, there's credits in there for the purchase of electric vehicles. There's credits for the manufacture and production of uh, zero emissions vehicles, um, energy projects and, and labor. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, it's a really big bill. And it, it was, um, it was, passed by the House of Representatives last year as part of House Democrats infrastructure bill, which ultimately did not get consideration by the Republican Senate. Um, I know given your interest in solar, I, I would highlight not only the, uh, the ITC for solar projects, but also the uh, energy efficiency credit for residential properties, which includes uh, solar electricity, solar water heating, um, battery storage properties that are, are solar powered. Um, these are basically all different ways of incentivizing property owners like many of you uh, to adopt solar energy wherever you can. Um, we anticipate that some or all of this bill will certainly pass the House, uh, as I think all of you have probably followed, the President is uh, uh, gung-ho about doing a roughly $3 trillion infrastructure package. I think candidly, um, you know, I, we, are, we are doing our best to make an infrastructure package bipartisan. Uh, we are gonna make a good faith effort for, for that to be the case. Um, if we cannot get bipartisan support, I think our intent is to advance an infrastructure bill under the reconciliation process, which probably puts us on a timeline of passing an infrastructure bill sometime after August. 
um, the, the, the reconciliation process has to start uh, formally uh, with the transmission of the president's budget, which we expect sometime next month. Uh, at a high level, the way this will work is the president is going to send us a, an outline potentially as soon as next week uh, of, of what he thinks the government should spend money on and, and you know, arose by another name. And in this case, that, that's an infrastructure bill. Um, and so what, what we're sort of waiting to see is, you know, you, many of you will know that Congress extended the existing tax incentives for solar power for two years at the end of last year. So this is not uh, a, a range of, of uh, solar power incentives that is about to expire. Um, and sometimes that can be an obstacle because I think as Mike would be the first to tell you, Congress works best and occasionally only with a deadline. And, and the deadline for a lot of these credits is not for another uh, you know, 20 odd months. Um, we expect that the president, when he puts out his budget proposal next month or next week, um, he, he's basically going to tell us of a $3 trillion infrastructure bill, here's the chunk of that that I want to devote to clean energy tax policy. And, and that will affect uh, what version of the Green Act ultimately uh, receives consideration in the two chambers and, and knock on wood, uh, makes it to the president's desk. Um, I think I'll probably pause there. there. There's a number of different directions I can go, uh, whether it's specific uh, tax credits, whether it's non-tax solar power that you'd like to talk about, uh, or just the political landscape generally and the, the, you know, the, the odds for uh, climate action over the next 18 months. I'm, I'm happy to take questions in any, uh, any area you'd like, but why don't I, why don't I pause there and, and turn it over to Ryan um, and, and go from there. Okay. Uh, that was great. Thank you, Crozier. That was exactly what I was looking for. Not, not that I, like most people here, we're terrified of the Republicans blocking whatever's going on. So we sure hope you can get this through, if no other method than con re reconciliation. Ryan, you're on. You want to share your screen? Sure. Let me do that. Okay. Tell me, uh, you see that? I can definitely see that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Ryan Tracy. Um, I'm a senior energy analyst at Sonoma Clean Power. Um, and um, George invited me here to speak to you. We, we deal with a lot of different things, but we've been really engaged in, in PSPS and, and how that's impacting our landscape and, and which customers are being left behind. And Oakmont often comes to the top of the list as, as we'll show you. Um, so I, I plan on sharing some data on, uh, on PSPS, um, give you kind of an overview of the infrastructure we see feeding Oakmont and what some of the areas are and potential mitigations. I do not work for PG&E, so a lot of these things are you know, inferred from the data that we, we do have. Um, and we do our best to advocate for things for, for PG&E, but, but do, do understand that um, when I go through this. Um, for, for those of you who aren't aware, Sonoma Clean Power is the um, community choice aggregation for both Sonoma and Mendocino counties. What that means is by default, um, if you get um, electric service in those counties, um, we generate the electricity for you. Um, PG&E still operates the transmission and distribution that brings it to your house, but um, we're the ones contracting for, for energy. And, and it's, it's really kind of a cool concept that's really driven the energy landscape in California over, over since I think it's been, uh, we, we, we formed in 2014 and we were the second community choice aggregation to come about. Um, but a lot of communities like ours are, are very invested in, in, um, in, the, in the, the battle against climate change and, and looking at what levers they can pull. And uh, CCAs have been a, a really powerful tool in, in being able to do something meaningful. Um, and Sonoma Clean Power specifically right now, you know, compared to PG&E who, who's, who gets you about 33% renewable energy, we're, we're currently generating our customers 50% um, renewable and 97% of it's carbon free. Um, we, since forming, we've, we've developed 120 megawatts of new re renewable resources. And, and we also have a, um, an energy product called Evergreen um, that some customers choose to upgrade to where you get 100% of your energy and it's renewable and local. Um, and the other cool thing about CCAs is we're not a corporation. Um, the proceeds from 
um, our revenues um, either pay for energy or they go into programs um, for the community. Um, and those programs are innovative. They're things like promoting building electrification, um, promoting EV charging, um, building a demand response infrastructure. So when there's peak energy use, we have smart devices that can respond to that and reduce, um, reduce the climate impact. Um, the other thing I did want to highlight here while, while I have your, uh, your attention is we are opening in downtown Santa Rosa right next actually to uh, Russian River Brewing. Um, we have a store, we're opening the Advanced Energy um, Center. I just had actually toured it earlier this, um, this week and it's going to be a really amazing place where um, lots of new technologies are going to be on display. There's going to be people you can talk to um, about improving energy efficiency in your home, the types of incentives that are out there. Um, I think it's going to be a really cool resource for the community. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And then the other cool thing is CCAs are, uh, in addition to, to actually doing things like procuring energy for the community, um, we're very engaged in policy making, um, especially at the state level. Things you know about energy, climate, and now even PSPS. You know we we can advocate for our communities. Where you know PG&E or some of the the other entities are looking at a statewide view. Um, we have um, we can have a voice, you know, specific to the concerns of our, our community. The um, and George, are you do you want to wait to the end for questions? Is that generally how you've done this? Yes, I would like to do that. Perfect. Okay. Um, so real quick, I did want to dive into first. I was going to dive into um, where your electricity in Oakmont comes from. So that's what this map is showing. Um, in Oakmont, there's there's over 3,400 uh, electric meters. The, um, you're actually kind of equally divided between um, two circuits. So um, those of you who are living north of the golf course are served um, by a circuit called Dunbar 1101. That's, that's coming from a substation over near Dunbar School. Um, the rest of Oakmont is powered by a, a substation in Rincon Valley. Um, the, um, there are about 800 meters in what the PUC is classifies as, as high fire threat territory. That's the yellow and the red um, that you see it shading in the map. Um, but a lot of those meters are um, have underground lines. So really, and we'll, we'll, we'll step into this more, really the issue that, that Oakmont's running into, the weak point is the, uh, the distribution upstream, what's connecting you to those substations um, in Rincon Valley and Dunbar. Um, and as you're aware in your community, there's, 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 there's lots of essential facilities and in addition to um, you know, water, communications, you know, there's a lot of customers that also rely on electricity for, for medical needs. So um, clearly a lot of critical loads that, that, that need to be served. The, um, this next slide is just to, to kind of highlight, I know everyone's well aware of how, how bad things are from a PSPS standpoint, but this really kind of, kind of brings it home. Um, so remember there's like, there's, there's like 3,400 meters in Oakmont. You can see that bar graph on the bottom of number of outages in Oakmont. And you see that you know, your whole community has been, been out in five of the events. Um, and Oakmont represents 5% of the overall outages that we've tracked in our territory. Um, but you only represent 1.3% of our population. So Oakmont, you, Oak, the Oakmont community experiences four times more PSPS events than your average customer in Sonoma and Mendocino County. Um, so a real, real clear outlier. Um, the other thing is, you know, one, one story, one promising story we've seen elsewhere in our territory are there, there have been some concrete improvements and reduction in PSPS scope. You've probably seen a lot of the PG and EP, PR materials um, to that effect. Um, but Oakmont, that, isn't, that has not been true for Oakmont. There's been very little um, change in 2020 from a segmentation or, or some of the other technologies that PG and E's deployed to reduce scope. Um, those of you on Dunbar have seen um, no segmentation or grid flexibility employed to reduce your outages. Um, Rincon, um, those, those meters in the far northwest corner, there are 300 meters that were left on in the October 2020 event. Um, and that was an event where they decided to keep Rincon substation on, which normally they have not. And I, I actually live in Skyhawk, so I've, my fate used to be tied to yours most of the time. Um, but that, um, that October event, they are able to energize that, that, north, that northwest pocket. Um, and there's one other event where they shifted some meters from Dunbar over to Rinkin back in 2019. But other than that, there's been very little, um, very, 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 very little um, improvement in um, the PSPS situation for, for Oakmont. Um, I did wanna, I'm gonna step real quick through some of these, these upstream um, facilities, just so you're kind of aware of some of these other linkages. The, um, as I mentioned, half of, 
Um, Oakmont is powered from the Rincon substation. This is a, a kind of an aerial photograph view. The, Rin the Rincon substation is located north of Maria Korea High School. You can see that the arrow down there in the bottom right hand corner. Um, it's this really unfortunate situation where the substation is located a half a mile north of um, the border of high fire threat territory. Um, so what ends up happening, what, what, what has been happening is PG&E has been having to shut down everything downstream of Rincon, which is you know, 14,000 meters total, um, because the lines pass over a half mile of high fire threat territory before they get into Santa Rosa, where there really is no you know, fire threat. So there's this really weak link um, affecting everyone under Rincon. Um, and the, uh, the, the, you, we hear some talk on PG&E about transmission, but actually the only real transmission outage, so when I talk about transmission, I'm talking about the energy that is coming from the power plants to the substation itself. We've only had one event where Rincon actually was down due to transmission. All the other events, PG&E was get, able to get power to the substation, but they had to shut it off because of this half a mile um, weak link. Um, the good news is that pg e did identify this in their 2021 wildfire mitigation plan as a high priority project to actually underground um, the circuitry running from the substation. Um, so if they actually can get that done, that will, um, that will improve the fate for a lot of Santa Rosa and, and potentially um, a portion of Oakmont if they can get that figured out. Um, they do only forecast, they just recently released kind of a study for how much they expect transmission to go out in Rincon was higher on the list, um, but still they only showed five transmission events over the next 10 years where, where the transmission to the substation itself would have to be shut off. Um, the other substation, Dunbar substation. So this is located um, right near Dunbar School, um, down south of Kenwood. Um, similar to, to Rinkin, there's been very little, um, there, there have really not been any transmission issues of getting electricity to the substation itself. Um, the only time that that was an issue was during the Kincaid fire. Um, the, the, issue, um, the issue is though that to get the energy from the Dunbar substation to Oakmont, um, you're going on these lines, these distribution lines that do go in and out of high fire threat territory as they go through Kenwood um, and, and up north. Um, so that's been, that's been an issue. And the other issue is so a lot of these circuits have these prongs that go up into the hills. So you have a circuit, like let's say we have a circuit running to, to we have the circuit running to Oakmont. Um, there are forks that are heading up the hills and each one of those would have to be segmented and shut off, you know, to keep energy flowing to Oakmont safely. And there actually has been some improvement on that, um, but not enough to, um, as, I, as we showed in that graph before, to keep those circuits in Oakmont that are on Dunbar online. Um, this graph here is showing um, the distribution network within Oakmont. So as I, as I mentioned, most of the lines are underground. That's the gray lines here. The red lines are overhead lines. So there are there is this line along, along Oakmont Drive and into the north that is overhead, um, which would, you know, but most of that is outside high fire threat territory. Um, but there are some there are some issues with that that would need to be segmented. But in general, you know, a lot of a lot of the overlap with high fire threat territory is is underground. So uh, some some mitigations that Sonoma Clean Powers identify. And th again, these are things we're kind of working with when we when we do have an audience with PG&E or when we're talking to the PUC. These are the types of things we, we talk to them about. Um, unfortunately, there's been very little transparency on what projects are ongoing, when they're planned, when they're happening, um, and that sort of thing. So what we try to do is just share our ideas when, when, we, when, we, when we come upon them. So the first one, as we, we are talking about, is this Rincon distribution hardening. You know, the substation is getting those, those, line, those half mile lines right near the substation um, underground. And again, that actually has been identified by pg as a project. Um, the other issue is hardening the line between Dunbar and, um, and Oakmont. Um, we talked about the branches that that are upstream of Oakmont that go into the hills that would need to be segmented. Um, and then also there's, there's areas of Rincon um, along Highway 12 as it connects to Oakmont Drive that go near high fire threat territory that would need to be hardened. Um, the other temporary stopgap measure, and this is something pg and deployed in, um, in Calistoga, um, would be temporary generation sited within Oakmont. Um, and 
they, they call this mid feeder because it would be it would be deployed in the circuit itself. Um, because at first pg e was looking at bringing temporary generation to the substations, but as I went through, that's not an issue. The issue is between the substation and Oakmont. So this would be staging generation within Oakmont itself, um, because a lot of Oakmont is safe to energize. The issue is its connections. Um, I have three other slides here. George asked me to, to share some on solar and storage um, growth within Oakmont and Sonoma Clean Tower. So here's a couple slides on that. Um, the, when I say DER, sorry, I hate acronyms, but here I am using them. The DERs, if you don't know, are stand for distributed energy resources. It's kind of a generic term that you know would, would have solar, batteries, geothermal heat pumps, those, those, those sorts of things would all fall under that umbrella. Um, but um, what we're seeing is an Oakmont um, capacity is growing quickly. We're seeing over 30% annualized growth in solar. I'm, I'm, this data is only through Q3 2020. My guess is you have over one and a half megawatts in Oakmont now. Um, storage capacity is even growing more dramatically in 2020, capacity quadrupled versus the previous year. Um, the average solar system size in Oakmont is about 5 kW, average storage is 4 kW. I don't have the, um, I just have the kW, I don't have the kWh for the storage. There's quite a bit of supplier diversity um, when we're looking at, you know, who's installing what, but Tesla and Sunrun are um, the most popular installers. If you if you zoom out and look at this um, territory wide, um, I have both overall, which this would include like commercial type projects. Um, but you can see here, you know, the average growth rate in our territory is 15%. So solar adoption in Oakmont is actually twice what it is through the rest of our territory. And storage is still growing very dramatically in Sonoma um, Clean Power's territory itself at 66% per year. But again, you, you guys had a 400% year over year growth rate. Um, and um, you can see here on residential capacity, overall, we almost have 100 megawatts within our territory of, of behind the meter solar, which is, is amazing. And we actually have almost eight megawatts of storage. Um, and the average residential sizes are, are, are pretty close to what you guys see in Oakmont. Um, another thing, uh, George, when we touch on our microgrids, so this is obviously a, a, an evolving space that you know, we're keeping an eye on. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of, lot of energy on. And there's, there's a, the first two I list here are ones that are actually um, near operation or in construction. And those actually are both in Humboldt County where they've been really at the forefront of, um, of deploying microgrids. Um, there's one at the, the airport um, that's, that's currently, I think it's still under construction. Um, and what's really unique about that microgrid is they're pulling together. It's one of the first really good examples where they're pulling a bunch of different meters together. There's like the Coast Guard station, the airport and some other facilities. Um, and different customers, 20 total, um, that they're going to put put to get put together into this microgrid that's powered by solar and storage, um, and improve the resiliency, and also um, also help um, help 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 meet cl climate goals and and uh, and address some energy costs there. And that, that's really exciting to see. One microgrid that's actually already in operation, Humboldt County, is at the Blue Lake Rancheria. Um, and they actually even tested it out during one of the PSPS outages and they have a gas station there. I think they said they had 10,000 people actually come to them during that PSPS for services. Um, and they actually have a combination of solar storage and a backup um, diesel um, to make that work. Um, within our own territory, so we were looking at some applications of microgrids la um, last year. And one of the ones that really rose to the top of our list was was an opportunity in Fort Bragg where they had a um, what they called an express circuit. They actually already had the circuitry um, that connected their critical facilities, like their um, their police station, their their hospital, um, and the the city was looking at connecting that to a to a solar plant and storage, um, and and make that work. And I think that's that's still something under consideration. I think that the issue we've had with this project and other ones in our territory is PSPS has been such a moving target. Um, the story in Oakmont has been the same, but elsewhere in our territory, we've seen we've seen areas where PG&E has been able to address um, outages with you know either new methodology or um, or segmentation. Um, so the business case, um, as you'd say, for the for for the microgrid changed, um, and so that, that's been something we've been watching. Um, the other thing PG&E is starting to roll out is something they're calling remote grids. And what they're doing there is they're looking up in the hills. A lot of these are areas where you have um, like a mile of overhead line and there's only two customers at the end of that 
that line. And PG&E, when they look at it and they do the numbers and they have to harden that to meet their own standards, um, and they do the math and, and sometimes they've realized it's actually cheaper to build a microgrid for those customers and operate it than to uh, invest in the infrastructure. So that's something they're starting to actually actively do in our territory. There's actually been two flavors of that. One where PG&E actually still operates the microgrid and some where they're actually, the customers are getting an upfront cash payment um, to completely disconnect PG&E service and for them to develop a microgrid on their own. So that's something um, that'll be interesting to watch. Um, the other thing, the other, this is in a permanent microgrid, but PG&E has a temporary generation program. And this is the one I was talking about with Calistoga. We've seen very little use of this in our territory, but they've also, they've done some of it in the Sierras. Um, also where they're staged diesel generation at the substation or in Calistoga, it actually is this mid feeder variety where they actually will do it near downtown and, and they're able to cut off the branches out, out that go into high fire threat territory and, and put the generator within that safe to energize zone and, and keep it online um, during the PSPS outage. And then the uh, final example I have here, this is a, this is the large, the largest one we've seen recently is the city of Gonzales, which is, um, it's in the Salinas Valley in Monterey County is actually looking at building a very large um, by comparison microgrid near their industrial park that'll have solar storage and thermal generation. And one thing is we, we are finding a lot of microgrids, especially for the PSPS application, you, you end up needing some kind of, um, you, you often find yourself needing to add some kind of thermal generation or fossil fuel component to be able to to, to make it work because you know you, you might have cloudy to, to really design for the reliability you know for that cloudy day make sure you have solar if it's a three-day outage and so a lot of that stuff can be difficult to design for so i think that's why you're, you're seeing people sometimes also invest in a fossil component um, for their microgrid to provide that last bit of um, reliability then this is the the last slide i had um the um policy is not my my wheelhouse but there are a couple of things we're watching um, at Sonoma and Clean Power. One is um, ITC eligibility. As Crozier talked about, the Green Act is one um, that, that we're very excited about. I think there's another proposal too, um, where you know it's not only extending ITC eligibility for solar, but also um, making storage in and of itself eligible for the ITC instead of having it paired with solar, which you know kind of expands the um, the, the the applications for storage and and ability to use it. So we're, we're watching that closely. Um, the other thing is there has been some um, some legislation that includes federal grants from microgrids um, that support critical infrastructure. Um, I think there's a little bit of funding passed last year, but the, the scale of, of these, these other proposals is, is much larger um, and it would really help um, proliferate um, this technology. Um, the other thing we're watching is there's a, the microgrid tariff is, is being um, I think it's in track three. There's different tracks in the PUC. I think it's entering track three, but in track two, I think they've they basically come up. There's there's a rule in in California, as a lot of you probably have heard of this over the fence rule, where when you when you create a microgrid, you have this difficulty because because in California you're not you're not allowed to connect two customers that um, it, into their own circuit generally. But there's been some movement on that. I think with the last iteration now, critical facilities there's there's wiggle room where they can be paired together. Um, and the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities are being, being forced to come up with ways to commercialize microgrids. So we'll see how that, that comes out. And I think that there's also a, um, a component of funding from the IOUs in that, within that tariff, um, which has also led to this PG&E community, community microgrid enablement program where PG&E is now looking for communities that want to put a microgrid in the ground and they're they're, they have a pot, they have they have some funding to be able to do the types of upgrades on their side to support those types of projects. Um, I did have a bullet here. My director of regulatory affairs asked me to put this in here. One thing that's kind of um, coming up a lot at the PUC and is something people should start thinking about is you know really putting a dollar value on resiliency because um, there is one. And I think a lot of a lot of these things you know they, they cost lots of money, but they also you know mitigate lots of costs. That's something that that, that we're trying to come up with a good robust answer to. And then the last thing I wanted to mention um, is that there is the um, there is a successor tariff being developed for, for net energy metering now in California. And there's there's a it, there's still a lot of different proposals, but I think you know there's a, there's there's some main themes and and one of them is to um, the the investor owned utilities are concerned about this idea of the um, people on them not paying their fair share 
and people not and then being having higher energy costs. So I think there, there's there's some component of trying to figure that out. Um, there's also looking at kind of the replacement value cost of energy. You know, right now solar is very cheap at the utility scale. So does it make sense to give people retail revenues? One thing that will be really interesting, I think, that might come out of it is the um, right now the the value of storage on the retail side is not. It, it, it's something, but it's not always, it's not a bit, it's not a primary driver when someone wants to put a battery in to come up with, you know, I'm not going to make money by, by shifting my solar to the evening. Right now, there, there's some of that, but not a lot. And I think oh, there's a lot of expectation that the NEM tariff, the new, the new rates after that will, will, will make that distinction between energy during solar hours and non-solar hours um, more harsh, which would, would improve kind of the economic signals that might be sent for people who are considering putting batteries um, in their in their homes. I think that's everything I, I kind of keyed up for their for presenting. Great show. Um, yeah. uh, I'm going to have two questions myself. The first is for Crozier. Uh, Crozier, uh, the the resolutions that uh, Ryan just referenced up at the top, the ones for standalone storage and for microgrids. Yeah. Um, uh, do those fit at all into the infrastructure plan? Yeah, so uh, HR 848 is the Green Act. Okay. Um, so we, we anticipate, you know, like I said, depending on the president's budget, uh, we anticipate that uh, figuring into a, a, an infrastructure bill uh, in, in some form. Off the top of my head, I actually don't know what HR 2096 is, but I'm, I'm guessing it's sort of a standalone bill that reflects uh, the, the standalone storage language in the Green Act, uh, which is pretty, you know, pretty common. Okay. Um, and so, so the short answer is yes, I hope. Okay. The, the, the whole issue of storage has dominated Oakmont's discussions because we would really love to be able to find a way to have more solar into storage at a community level. Okay. I mean, we have, we have, facilities on our major uh, buildings here. We have, we have solar panels. So if we could economically uh, store, that would make great sense. Okay, I'm going to, um, Ryan, we'll take you off and we will go back to the audience and we are ready for questions. So the way is you get your questions in, you can hit the chat. If you're smart enough to know how to do it electronically, you're welcome to do that. Or you can just raise your hand. So who's got a question for our speakers? I see Leslie and Bruce do. You're on. Whoops. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Leslie and Bruce, I, I think I unmuted you, so you're on. If I didn't unmute yourself. There we are. There you go. Okay. <laughs> can you hear us now? We can hear you now. Oh, great. Excuse me. Um, the main question that we have right now is we are having um, some delays um, that our contractor has told us due to the city of Santa Rosa Fire Department no longer allowing batteries to be installed inside garages unless there's a sprinkler system set up or an and imposing stricter restrictions on even batteries outside. Um, can anyone speak to what's going on and how we can uh, learn more and advocate for both uh, safety, but also um, being able to install battery storage at home? I'm, I'm gonna turn that over to Bert. Great, thank you. Um, so there's been some confusion over the last week about well, first of all, um, batteries in the garage, you have to be sprinklered, otherwise they're not allowed. So there's been some confusion for the last oh, week about uh, some of the new rules and regulations. So we're in the middle, the, the solar residential people are in the middle of putting together a Zoom with um, uh, Ian and Paul from the San Rosa uh, Fire Department for all of the uh, contractors that do business with Oakmont, so there's some clarity. So we mm -hmm. hope to have that done in the next within the next uh, week. Um, uh, everybody on this call uh, 
should be on the email list that sent out the information on the call. And once uh, Bert is able to get greater clarity, we will send out that information to the group. Okay, okay. Sue, you're on. Oh yeah, I just, I was uh, really interested in the slide that showed Oakmont and its increase over the last couple of years, but especially just this last year in volume of solar on homes. Um, is so Sonoma Clean Power keeps track of that? Uh, um, okay. So, because um, we've been, why do you think that might be happening? Is that happening in other areas as well? I mean, we do have a kind of a working program here to encourage and ed educate and inform, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I just wondered if you had some insight on or what we can do more of to get more people up. Yeah, no, I think um, you guys stand out relative to our old territory um, with um, with your growth in solar. So yeah, you're, you're you're showing over the last year thirty percent year over year capacity growth, and the average for Sonoma Clean Power, which it actually is pretty close to the statewide total, is um, is fifteen around fifteen percent. So you wow, guys are okay. growing at twice the rate. Um, and that, that's pretty remarkable, especially because Sonoma, or Sonoma, this area in general, has pretty large NEM penetration, which, you know, you kind of would expect things to start tailing off, you know, at, at, as you, as more and more, you, know, you kind of get more and more of the people who are really excited about it, get it. But we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're seeing continued growth. So, yeah. Okay. Keep up the good work. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for Crozier. Uh, Crozier, one of the things that uh, clearly impacts the decision making is the problem that as more and more people go to renewables, the fixed costs that are stuck for the old facilities and the old contracts and the, all that stuff that's stuck in the uh, operating utilities, the investor owned utilities, um, how, how does that get fixed? Because if um, uh, uh, those are real costs, I mean, they've gotta be absorbed in some way. When you say old stuff, uh, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, well, there's a bunch of, of costs that are related to the transmission and distribution of energy. Right. You may transmit less energy, but you've still got those big transmission towers and lines. Okay. And uh, it costs something to maintain them. Um, uh, so, so all the... Uh, those costs... Well, right now, for example, in, in throughout... PG&E's territory, we've got the cost of mitigation for possible fires. Yeah. Okay. And, and those have to be absorbed. The way they're normally absorbed is per kilowatt hour that is used. Right. Well, I have a fairly large battery uh, solar system with a battery. On an annual basis, I am net positive. I, I do not actually absorb any energy. Good for you. But at the same time, uh, I recognize I've got, I should be paying for part of the, the mitigation against the fires. Yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I would say that can, candidly, I, I don't think we are at the point in, in the process of uh, decarbonizing our, our energy system and transitioning to renewable energy I honestly don't think we're at the point yet where policymakers have started to think about, well, what do we do with all the old telephone poles? <laughs> or you like, I mean, and that's an oversimplification, but, but seriously, like there's, there's going to be this, um, you know, if, if we do this right, there's going to be this slowly but surely decreasing uh, utilization of traditional, uh, you know, energy produced by traditional uh, fuels. And, and, and there's this whole infrastructure in place that costs money to maintain and probably costs money to get rid of if it's no longer necessary. Um, and I, I, I don't think we're at that point yet. I mean, if, if th there are probably individual communities, particularly in states like California, where adoption of renewable energy is so high that you, you, can, you can feasibly and, and realistically start to have a conversation about, you know, what do we do when we don't need the fossil fuel uh, driven energy grid or, or infrastructure? Um, but, but from a congressional perspective, like we're nowhere near that point. I mean, we, one of the talking points that we run into from Republicans is that uh, the tax incentives for renewable energy were just meant to get these industries on their feet and they have therefore outlived their, their, you know, their utility. Um, and so, so, I mean, I think it's a good question. I wish I had a more satisfying answer for you, 
but I, I, I don't, I, I don't think we're at the point from a, a, a legislative perspective where we're starting to pair okay. clean energy incentives with, uh, uh, you know, here's what, here's how we're going to cover the cost of maintaining or, or, or eliminating older structures. I think it's a, it's a wise question, but not one that I, I have a ready answer to. Okay. Um, I know that Crozier has to leave in about five minutes. Does anybody have a specific question targeted for him? Um, no. Okay. Well, Crozier, stay on as long as you can, but when you got to go, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Absolutely. Ryan, uh, <clears throat> at one point there were, were batteries that were to be given out to those people who had medical conditions. Okay. Um, is that still happening? Um, yeah, PG, I know pg and &E had a program for getting batteries hooked up with medical baseline meters. And I, I, I believe Sonoma Clean Power was evaluating a similar program, but I'd, I'd have to get back to you on the details for that. Okay. There's um, a couple of questions in the chat there, um, George. I'm, I'm dealing with them. Okay, good. <laughs> um, grandfathering is a primary topic in the chat. The question was asked if you had a battery installed in your garage, is that still going to be okay? And the answer is yes. If it was installed according to the permitting process, yes. Obviously, if you installed it and didn't get a permit, that's a different issue. But I have a, I have a battery in my garage. Um, and the issue of a fixed charge uh, per month is part of the discussion that's going on with the net energy uh, metering uh, 3.0. That, that one of the possible, Brian, can you describe that or do you want me to try? Uh, either way. I mean, it all, I mean, really relates to the point you brought up too, is this idea of, yeah, how do you, how do you spread the costs of maintaining the infrastructure um, when, you know, more and more people are trying to generate their own electricity. Um, and one kind of thing that surprises people is we're actually, even, even though most people have air conditioning in our territory, we're actually a winter peaking um, territory. So energy usage peaks in Sonoma in December. Um, and although a lot of, a lot of people with solar, um, like George, you know, on an annual basis, you can, you can come out ahead or you're, you know, exporting on net. If you really try to make the, make the math work in December, you know, or whenever it's cloudiest and, and be able be, to be able to design for being completely off the grid is very difficult. So, you know, a lot of people are, we, we still need that connection um, to the grid during the winter time to be able to get through the, those periods. So yeah, it becomes difficult to figure out, you know, how, how, to, how to distribute those costs. And that's kind of where that NEM 3.0 comes in and looking at, you know, potentially having to, to have a fixed component or, or a different time of use structure that, that values energy in a more dramatic way, those sorts of things. The, um, this is a current discussion going on at the Public Utility Commission and what they're actually, one of the discussions is about increasing the monthly charge, but also increasing the, the uh, bonus if you are able to shift your energy from being available, let's say in the middle of the day when it isn't needed as much to six o'clock at night when it is needed. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay, uh, Ryan, one of the other questions here, um, are S is chip uh, credit still out there or not? Um, good question. I'm not the right person to ask, but I, th I think they were mostly subscribed, but that's definitely something we can get back to you on too. We have people who, who know that. <laughs> um, if, if there is still an active S chip program, that would be very important for us to know. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, there's been a, two comments about the federal credit being re increased back to 30%. Um, right. That is part of the Green uh, uh, Act. So Correct. if the Green Act is passed in exactly the way it's currently formatted, then the credit for solar will go back to 30% for this year up through 2025, if I remember correctly. So the answer is, but at the moment, it's been renewed at 26% for this year and next year. So if it isn't passed, that's what we've got. Okay, um, Nancy. Do you know what, we, we installed solar panels at the end of the last year. And so far, the company that put them in doesn't have batteries available. 
Does anybody know the status of batteries becoming more available? They were going to be putting in Tesla batteries, but don't have any. Bert, do you have any input on that? <clears throat> no, I don't. I know that there's there's plenty of Tesla Tesla batteries available. The difficulty seems to be in finding people that are able to install them. But uh, there's a, supposed to be a ton in the Petaluma warehouse. Okay, it must be because the company that was going to put ours in has a long list of people that were waiting. So now they're really busy. So that may just be why we haven't gotten it yet. Because they're taking a first come first served. Does that make sense? Boy, I, I can't answer that. I mean, you know, Tesla's a funny company. But I, you know, I, I did want to mention one thing. If you install batteries this year, you, you do get the solar credit for the batteries, even though they're not being installed in conjunction with the solar, pan, uh, the solar uh, panels. Yeah, we get the tax credit for this, this lap for 2020. Yeah. If you install the batteries this year, you get the tax credit for 2021. Right. But we, we like the bat, we want the batteries. So we don't know where we are on the list. I just wonder if the batteries are available. So if they're available now, we just have to wait until they can put them in. Okay. Um, Thank John, you. John had a thought he wanted to share here. John? Yes. Um, can you hear me, George? Yeah. Yeah. Just to answer that part of that battery question, we heard from the Tesla rep and I confirmed it independently. Tesla will not install a standalone battery if you have solar. They're only, Tesla will only install solar plus battery. So you're gonna to have to get your battery from someone other than Tesla. Our, our company, we use Northern Pacific Power and mm -hmm. they were gonna install Tesla batteries, but they're the ones that are gonna install. Right, and- It's not Tesla installed. Last summer to fall, Tesla cut off a lot of their small suppliers and right. cut off their inventory to batteries. But if you can find someone who has inventory who's not Tesla, then they can do that. Uh, Nancy, there, there are a couple of new players in the battery business. And the one in particular that I've seen referenced positively is Enphase. Yes, they're so you might want George. They're you relatively might want expensive. You've got a, they come in a four kilowatt and a 10 kilowatt. So if you want to get the equivalent of a power wall with 13.5, you need to get a four plus a 10 and it's significantly more expensive than a power wall. Which brought me back to my question, George, which you partially answered, but since people in Oakmont, it's really critical for new insta installations if they qualify medically for that uh, SGIP that more funds become available this year and next year into that pool. And uh, because that makes all the difference between being able to afford a, a battery solar system and not. Uh, the tax credit, you know, 26% is one thing, but getting 80 to 95% of it paid through that. So since the state is now running at a surplus and we're, the state's gonna get more money uh, through the, uh, the rescue package that was just passed, I know uh, Sonoma Clean Power is probably the best one to ask, but it seems a priority to get another big pot of money in the state budget for that. And I don't know where that stands right now. Well, Ryan's gonna get back to us with that, but okay. uh, I will say what Sonoma Clean Power did do was it was willing to work with all of its customers who needed the SGIP money to help them apply for it and, and uh, get it. We were also doing, uh, we were fronting the incentive as well, where you we would pay your incentive, because right now you you end up having to wait for your application to get approved. So Sonoma, Sonoma Clean Power had, did have a program when there were SGIP slots available, where we would give you the credit right away. But and you'll get we back would... to us on, on a future, the chance for a future pot, because without another future right. pot, it's gonna, it doesn't matter. People are going to get squeezed. Yeah. Right. Thanks. We got approved with the SGIP. And I think through Sonoma Clean Power, as I recall, but since they couldn't get the batteries, we still don't have them. Yeah. But if we, if there was a different kind of battery available, I mean, does it matter what kind of battery it is that's covered? Ryan, do you know? Not that I know, but I'm not, I'm not the expert on that. <laughs> okay. George, do you know? Or, or uh, I don't, I don't believe it, it, it is not specific to one battery versus another. 
it doesn't matter. But the dollar amount's going to stay fixed. So, Probably. so, so we pay more if it's a more expensive, you know, like you're talking about in phase yeah. costing more than Tesla. As someone who put in a large battery, I've got a 20 kilowatt battery. Um, let me comment two things about my decision making, okay, which is not necessarily influence yours. One was when I took the cost of the battery and then I knocked it down because I did get the investment tax credit. So, because I paid cash, okay, so I knocked that down, I got that. Then I looked at what would be the alternative cost if I were to put in a real operating generator not just a little thing I could buy out of Home Depot, but one large enough to keep the house going for a while, okay? And the answer was that by that point, there wasn't a lot of incremental cost for the battery. And then I checked in with the, the, uh, uh, my realtor friends who basically said, if you've got solar panels and the battery, you will be able to get those back to a significant extent if you sell your house. But it, I mean, it, 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 it is the value of those is not zero in selling the house. No. Okay. Uh, Ryan, will California residents be required to move to time of use billing? That's a very relevant question, actually. Um, for everyone's awareness, I think in April, um, everyone in our territory will be defaulted to time of use. Um, but you can opt back to your flat rate if you want. But if you do nothing, you get you get opted over to time of use. Okay. And those of you who installed solar, you know, when you install solar, I think it was since 2016, you're required to be on time of use. Um, I'm trying to remember if that was the date, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Ryan, can you give us a, a, a layman's version of what is time of use pricing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, time of use pricing is um, so you can you have yeah you have two flavors as a res residential customer with. Um, uh, with PG&E and, and Sonoma Clean Powers, you can either opt to be charged the same amount of electricity no matter what time of day it is, or you can go on a rate where electricity is more expensive when it's more expensive for the utility to procure. So that'd be like in e evenings and ramps when there's less solar power, electricity is more expensive and it's less expensive during the day when there is, um, when there is ample energy. So it, it aligns, and some people that works out to where you save a little bit of money, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so it, it's something to keep keep an eye on. And uh, the nice thing about time of use is if you do change your habits, you know, you could have a meaningful impact on your, on your energy bill. And really, if you have solar, one of the things you can do if you don't have a battery is you can choose to run things like your washing machine, dryer, things that use electricity. You can run those in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. The person who doesn't have solar, they're, they're typically being driven to run them, um, at nighttime. Okay, we're about ready to end questions. Ryan, I want to thank you so much for having uh, uh, given us those wonderful slides. Uh, that's some great data. It's, it's a little weird looking at the picture of Oakmont with those two, <laughs> two circuits and wondering what's gonna happen come this October. Right. Um, so uh, our next session will be on the 14th of April. And that's going to be a focus on what's changed since 2017 in terms of fires and uh, electricity outages. We have two speakers coming from the Santa Rosa Fire Department and a speaker coming from PG&E. But the target, the target then is not going to be solar, okay? The target's gonna be PSPS events and fire preparation. So look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you again, Ryan, so much for joining us. Yeah, you bet. Thank, thank you. you.